I'm stepping away from the Gospel of Luke this morning because I'm concerned. I'm concerned because I've sat and participated in classes the last couple weeks and heard from pastors from honestly all over the country and heard how and heard how how churches are being ripped apart because of how they have wrestled through hard decisions in the last six months. I'm concerned because I sat through a testimony from a professor, pastor, who's ministered at a church for 15 years, walked through numerous ups and downs and battles, and was grieved as he walked into our class because a number of families had just left the church because they, as a church, were going to obey a governor's request to wear face masks to a service. And now several families were no longer part of his church. I'm concerned because I hear passion and I hear anger. More so about temporary issues, but silence when it comes to what we're really supposed to be about, excited for, and passionate for. I'm concerned because I fear we, and I say we generally, generally, even beyond these walls, have become distracted from our purpose as Christians. Or maybe we always were distracted, and the last few months only showed it. This year, there has been a lot to pull away our attention. Admittingly, big things. Admittingly, important things. There have been virus, riots, quarantines, regulations, colliding worldviews, growing hostility, job losses, economic roller coasters, distrust in our leaders, distrust in our information providers and news networks, political turmoil. There has been big, important things. But I fear we become distracted by them all. It is so easy to become consumed by it. You can't stop thinking about it. It becomes your focus. The new article that may or may not actually even be true, but it supports your position, is what gave you joy today. The next report that comes up, the new numbers, the trying to win the argument from the person that doesn't see it the way you do it. The fear because it looks like your future is going to be different than the past. The anger at those who attack what you love. But here's my problem, here's my concern. All of that isn't ultimately what we're supposed to be about, Christians. It's not what's supposed to be what drives us. It's not supposed to be what gives us passion. It's not what's supposed to be what keeps us up at night. It's all temporary. My concern is, my, my concern is that, and I'm talking to myself and I'm talking to us, my concern is that we've gotten to a point where we view the person next to us as an enemy, not as an individual in need of the gospel. My concern is that we are more passionate about personal, physical freedoms than we are about people in bondage. Spiritually. Let me balance this. I am not saying that we ignore the world around us. I'm not saying what's going on doesn't matter, that it's not important. I'm not saying that we just, 
we bury ourselves in books by old theologians that ignore the world and the struggles. I am not saying that. What I'm saying is our purpose as Christians should dictate how we engage the world around us. I'm saying our purpose as Christians should dictate the way we think, the way we love, what we pray about, what we're passionate about, how we respond. I'm concerned because I fear we become distracted. And by becoming distracted, we lower what our life is about to the temporary. And by becoming distracted, we get bent out of shape about something that will not matter one second into eternity. It's easy to become distracted. So what are we supposed to be focused on? Where is our passion? What's our purpose? The Apostle Paul gives it to us. He lives it for us. He models it. Ephesians 3. The end of the chapter flowing into what I read just a few moments ago is a prayer by Apostle Paul. And I could simply just summarize the prayer by saying it is a prayer with the passion of spiritual growth for God's glory. Now, Paul, to get to that point, if you read the prayer, it is six verses with one sentence that's a massive run-on with complex phrases, but let's boil it down to, it is growth for God's glory. Pick the passage up one verse before he starts praying. Verse 13. So I ask you, church at Ephesus, not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Now this is the, this is the foundation, motivation now that he's going to go to prayer. It's his burden. It's his passion. Did, did you catch it? I am, I am burdened, church at Ephesus, that you will not lose track, that you will give up, that you'll wave the white flag because I am here suffering. Paul sits in a prison because he's ministered the gospel and his concern is the spiritual well-being and their response to his suffering. He's, he's sitting in prison for preaching the gospel and his concern is that people hundreds of miles away will not hear about it and become disillusioned and have their faith shaken and begin to say, wait a minute here, if this happens to Paul, this might happen to me and walk away. Here's Paul sitting in prison, suffering. I think what Paul's doing, and we can define as suffering. I think some of us, we define suffering as a bad case of hiccups and the McDonald's soft serve ice cream machines down today. And so you say, oh, and that's not a big deal. I've worked McDonald's. I know how people respond when the soft serve ice cream thing is down. And it ruins people's days. What Paul does is suffering. He's experiencing financial hardship. He's not working. He's experiencing job loss. He's not making tens right now. He's experienced the impact of corrupt political leadership. He's experiencing the loss of all personal freedom. This isn't you don't get to leave your house for certain things. This is you don't get to live in your house. He's experiencing loneliness. Yet going through all that, what's his focus? Don't miss this, please. What's his focus? What, what's his passion? 
Where where does his burden lie right now? He is facing injustice far more than that. And his burden is the spiritual well-being of others. He is facing the loss of liberties. And he is spending time praying and pouring his heart out to God for them. And in fact, I've just taken a step back and just just meditated on Paul's example. And then look at my own life because Paul's life example is let me give up my liberties within Christianity and let me even forego my political freedoms for the sake of the advancement of the gospel. And when I say let me give up my political freedoms, it is not just a little thing in his life. It means let me not call my Roman citizenship out and therefore I'll not go to prison or get whipped for the sake of the gospel. What's his concern? His concern that his other Christians would grow spiritually for God's glory. And that is what motivated him and drove him and made him forgo liberties and endure suffering for something worth far more. Read his prayer. Verse 14, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length, the height, the depth. And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to you who is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think. According to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church. And in Jesus Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. We're going to dig in. But as we go through these phrases and this petition, do not forget where Paul is sitting, what he's enduring, and yet through that all, what his focus still is, what his passion still is. He begins his prayer, and then he begins to dive in. Very simply, we're going to look at a petition for prayer, the power for prayer, and the praise in the prayer. The petition, there's a lot going on. The first thing he prays for is simply a petition for the Spirit's empowerment. That according, that in line with your abundant, glorious riches, God, would you strengthen these individuals over here in their inner being by your Holy Spirit? In the very, in the, in the very heart of who they are, In their inner being. Paul uses this phrase elsewhere, 2 Corinthians. Though our outward self is wasting away, your inner being is renewed day by day. By going to the inner being, he's going to the very heart of who they are, their love, their passion, their soul, their identity. He is going to the very heart of where God is working. I'm amazed, just as I started prayer here, Paul's focus here is I want the Spirit to work in their inner being. And yet I look at so much of our prayers and so much of our prayer requests and so much of our passions and so much of our burdens has to do not with our inner being, but with an outward physical body that's guaranteed to waste away. It's guaranteed. Paul's resigned to it. I love it. My outward body is literally falling apart. It just ain't working the way it's supposed to anymore. And guess what? It's going to keep on falling apart. So my concern is not what I know is already going to break down. My concern is the inner being that is being renewed day by day where you are working God. He 
God. I sit here in a prison. My prayer is not for me. My prayer is for my brothers and sisters in Christ. That the day the Spirit would strengthen them at the very core of who they are in their soul. It would change them. It would change them from the inside to the out. So much. We get this wrong so often. We go from the outside and forget about the inside. So much of our preaching, so much of our, 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 our Christianity is, is outside and we forget where it actually resides in our heart. That's why we can have preaching that is it's just filled with a don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, and you better go do this. Because it's simply focused on the external outside changes. This is why we can have preaching that is just like seven steps to a better marriage. 27 steps to being rich for God. And all that is is just, it's, it's a weed whacker chopping off the weeds and forgetting that there's still roots underneath the ground. I don't know enough a lot about a yard, but I know enough that my weeds come back every single week. Even though I weed whack them down. But we, we do this in our focus spiritually. We, we, take, we take the struggle of our life and we see it play itself out in so many different areas and we say we got to do better here and we got to change this over here and we want to mend this over here and we ignore the very heart of the problem which is inside of us. This is where Paul's prayer goes. Not help them fix their lives up so they have a little more ease this week. But would you radically transform them from the inside and their, by the spirit We need interchange. We don't need a dressed up, made up life that looks a little bit better on the outside. We need inner transformation. How does that happen? Some of you tried for years to be good, (laughs) you're still trying. Some of you, for so many years, you thought you had to be more good than bad, and if you could keep the outside looking somewhat moral, God would be okay with it in the end, and you'd be just fine. And what you didn't realize for so long was the problem wasn't your actions. It was a dead heart that you couldn't change. What you needed was not an extreme makeover of a better life. You needed new life through the power of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ's death upon the cross. Christian, the same power that saves you is the same power that is working in your life today. If the Spirit had enough power to bring you to spiritual life, if the Spirit had the power to be the defibrillator to shock you to life. Does the Spirit not have the power to continue to transform your life? This is where Paul's prayer is going. They still need heart work, God. They still need inner transformation work, God. Yes, I see evidence over there in that relationship. I see evidence over here. I see evidence that there's things I want to see happen. But really where I want the work to go, God is right down deep in who they are. Change it. Now, I'm amazed at this verse. I'm amazed at this whole prayer. There There is no aspect in this prayer that he's actually praying that the church at Ephesus physically does something different. He's not. There's no action point. It is all prayer about God's work in them. Would the Spirit work in them? Which, which pushes me then to say, wait a minute here. This is not just us sit back and say, well, good. Spirit's doing the work. He's got the power to change me. I hope he gets busy because I need some changing. There is still responsibility. I can go to, I can go to Galatians 5. Walk in the Spirit. 
so that you produce fruit. So I need heart change. Where do I get it from? I get it from the nuclear, supernatural power of the Holy Spirit working in my life. I get it from the Spirit opening my eyes up and convicting me and ripping me up as I read God's Word. I get it from the Spirit that that strengthens my heart that I can even desire to glorify God. I get it from a Spirit who gives a way to fight temptation and escape it. I give it for a spirit who convicts my heart when I am convinced that I'm okay. And not just convicts me about what I'm wrong, but gives me the strength to continue to wrestle with it. What's the result? So he says that I may grant to you the strength and the with power through his spirit in your inner being. What's the result of this? So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That's the result. That, 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 that Christ would actually take up residence and dwell within you. Now, now, some of you are like, well, that's salvation, Pastor. I got that when I was saved. Christ has been in me. I, I heard about that before. Okay. The, the word dwell here, man, it's, it's far more than just that. It's a deeper level. I read somebody and was illustrating this week that it is, it is the difference between living somewhere and being at home somewhere. So let me illustrate it this way. Um, just over five years ago, my wife and I moved into our house, okay? Um, we used a moving company, big old crates that we packed up in Texas, and they were going to ship it. The plan was we were going to arrive, the crates were going to arrive at the same time. We unpacked the crates, and voila, we're home. Um, that didn't happen. Like, we made it all the way through Illinois before the crates even left Texas because there was a problem. I put all my library in one crate. There's a max limit, okay? I went way over it. They couldn't even lift it. So we waited for almost two weeks for our stuff to arrive. So for the first two weeks, where did we reside? In that house. We slept on air mattresses, out of suitcases, no furniture, no curtains. Nothing says welcome home like waking up at five in the morning because the sun came up on an air mattress in an empty room and having to crawl to the bathroom because you want the, don't want the whole neighborhood to see you at that moment. Did we live there? Yes. Was it ours? Was it home? No. Now, five years later, I've added two bedrooms, remodeled the bathroom, got rid of the whole 1950s look. Don't know what was happening during the 1950s, but I'm not for it, okay? If that's still your look, sorry. Okay, we got rid of all that. Paint colors have been changed. It is us now. It looks like us. It's our home. It feels home. That is what Paul is praying for here. Not that Jesus Christ is just in you and you are in Christ, but that Jesus Christ would actually dwell in you, that he would so change your life that he could dwell and make it his home. It's transformation. Paul sits in prison. He suffers, he experiences injustice, yet he's not losing sleep about what the Roman government's going to do. He's not been out of shape. He goes to God in prayer. He doesn't pray for removal of suffering. He doesn't pray for changes in government authority. He doesn't pray for a get free out of jail card. He prays that other people would grow spiritually. He prays a gospel, Holy Spirit powered prayer for others' well being. It's not just Holy Spirit power he's looking for. It's a petition for a growing knowledge of Christ's love. Verse 17, halfway down, that you being rooted and grounded in love, that's, that's, already, a, that's already something that's happened. 
He's not praying for it. He's, he's realizing it's already there. That you have already been established in Christ's love. May be able to comprehend what is, with all the saints, what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth. Now, now Paul, if you're wanting like another phrase in there, join the club, okay? There's part of like, of what, Paul? Like, if it's the breadth and the length and the depth and the height of, of, of what? And I've read about seven commentaries and got seven different answers. I'm just going to simply say, I think the context says, to understand the breadth and the height and the length and the depth of Christ's love. It's exactly what's before it and it's exactly what's after this phrase. It's just understood. That you would comprehend the vastness of Christ's love for you. And before you say, oh man, pastor, I've got that one down. Christ loves me, amen. I know that. I've been singing, I've been singing Jesus love me for years. I know this one. Verse 19. And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. You don't have it down yet. <laughs> you, you don't got it. You remember, you remember, um, uh, you remember like your first day of algebra, 10th grade or something like that, 11th grade, and you get to algebra class and, and the teacher puts up on the board something like, like 4 plus x equals 5. And in like two seconds, you know what X means, right? X equals one. One person got it right, okay. Other people were still working on the problem, okay? And you're like, I got this algebra thing down. I don't know what everybody else was scared about. I know algebra. And then maybe your teacher passed out something else or you flipped to the back of like textbook number three and you saw an equation that looked like this. And your first thought was like, I... I that's alien jargon, I think. I don't even know that. That's not even math anymore. They put in letters all over. Through the, I, don't, I don't know what they're talking about. Beats me. Okay, some of you better not take the next hour of my sermon and try to figure that thing out, okay? Because that's not the point of this, okay? The point is, I may grasp an X plus one, sorry, X plus one equals two kind of level of God's love. But that does not mean that I have drained the depths of God's love. I haven't come close. I haven't come close. And what Paul is saying here is you might know level this of God's love. Your mental capabilities are here. Just know that God's love is infinite so it goes way up here. So even if you go from level 27 and you work really hard to comprehend level 28 of God's love, know that you're not even going to come to the limit of God's love before your brain starts breaking apart. You won't comprehend it. What would change? What would change in your life if you comprehended God's love, Christ's love for you, just to, just to one more level, what battle with sin would change if we comprehended God's love for us only slightly more? What depression would be done if we could comprehend God's love just a little bit more? What marriages would be mended if we could just wrap our minds around a little bit more of God's love? This is Paul's burden. It's his passion. And again, I say he's sitting in the middle of a prison, in the middle of a corrupt government, in the middle of uncertain futures, with freedoms being ripped away. And you know what was on the top of his list? That other people would have Holy Spirit power and a growing knowledge of Christ's love. That was his burden. That's it. That's his passion. That's his focus. That's his aim. Would other people grow spiritually for God's glory? Church, have you lost your aim and focus? What are you most concerned about today? Spiritual growth of others and you for God's glory? Or the next news cycle? 
what dominates your what dominates your prayer life right now the spiritual growth of you and others for God's glory or the alleviation of physical needs a potential possible political battle conflict in the world that is so far away from you what consumes your thinking right now what brings you to tears the facts of your position the frustration that people don't think the same way you do or the spiritual growth of others for God's glory as our focus become derailed we are consumed consumed distraught fearful upset over something some things that yes may be important but are not supposed to be the passion of our life Now, Paul swung for the fences with this prayer. Baseball season started Friday, so I can use a baseball analogy. He swung for the fences with this prayer. I mean, this is big prayer, right? I mean, this is, I'm praying for a whole church of people to have Holy Spirit power to change them from the inside out and that their minds would hurt because they understand Christ's love a little bit more. And he swung for the fences prayer. This is big prayer. This is, this is, this is way more than our help Johnny have a good day, bless all those missionaries, and thank you for this food, amen, prayers. I mean, he, he's going big here. And so there's part of me when I'm saying, like, Paul, wait a minute here. You are asking for all the Christians located in one city to be spiritually transformed and have revival. How? This is big, Paul. He is praying big. I know there are times where I've prayed prayers, gospel prayers, God's salvation prayers, men marriages prayers, depression crushing prayers, victory over sin prayers. And then in the back of my mind, I begin to think, well, that's just not going to happen. Right? I'm probably asking for too much. Let's bring this down a notch or two and then we'll, we'll pray that. What gives Paul the confidence to pray what he prays? Paul's not saying I'm praying for too much. He's saying I actually can pray for more. Because there's power here. Verse 20. Now to him. He's closing this up now. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we could ask or think. On what grounds? According to the power at work within us. What's that power? God himself, the Holy Spirit, in work in us. Paul's saying, wait a minute here, you think, you think this was big? Guess what? I could have asked for more and God has the ability to do it. Guess what? He is, has the power to do far more than I could ask or think. I mean, when we even get to our creative levels and we, we, we put into like wishing for things, we even put caps on it. Um, so like you get to like a genie, like we know it. You know the rules, right? You find a genie, what's the cap? You only get three wishes, right? And there's certain things you can't even wish for, right? Right? Like you can't make people fall in love and you can't make people come back from the dead. You, so even when we create like this ultimate thing of, of power that we can wish on something to make something happen, we, we limit it. And Paul just said, guess what here? Your mental capabilities and your imagination cannot cap out God's power. So go for it. Now some of us don't like this verse. Because you've prayed for things and they don't happen. Some of us taking this verse and we pray for everything between like a fixed bone and a million dollars. Because hey, God can do more than we can ask or think. So I'm asking for this because God can do more so that maybe I'll get two million. 
The sad reality is this verse has actually revealed our idolatry so often. Because when we read God can do more than we can ask or think, what do we think? We think alleviation of physical sufferings and temporary blessings. And we say that's really important. God, you're not doing that. Paul says God can do more than we can ask or think. And what is he talking about? He is talking about spiritual regeneration and spiritual transformation. Is that not more glorious than the physical blessings that we daydream about? Finally, we get to the ultimate purpose of Paul's prayer and desire. I said several times this morning that the focus of Paul is spiritual growth for God's glory. We unpacked the growth. It's Holy Spirit transformation. It is Christ's love, knowledge growing in us. We've unpacked the means for that to happen. It is power of God. But I haven't mentioned the glory part. The praise of the prayer. To him, God, be glory in the church and Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Ultimately, this is where my concern rests. It rests in the truth that we exist for the sole purpose of bringing God glory individually. And that this church exists for the sole purpose of bringing God glory. We come together to bring him glory. Yet we so easily forget it. In our purpose, we drift away from glory. We move it to different things. On a large scale, we can do it as a church. We switch it away from glory to budgets and programs and attendance numbers. Not God's glory. On an individual level, my concern is that we consider life not through the lens of God's glory. We consider it through the lens of comfort. We consider our decisions not through the lens of what is going to glorify God. We, we, we put it through what I like, what I've always done, what I'm passionate about. Not God's glory. We think about gathering with other Christians. We don't think about it with the same passion that Paul thought about it as what's going to cause other people to grow and glorify God in their lives. We think about it through what makes me comfortable. What do I enjoy? What do I like? We easily, so easily drift away from a purpose of glorifying God into a purpose of glorifying self. The passion is, in the midst of suffering, I am burdened that others spiritually grow through the power of the Holy Spirit for God's glory. Yet if you could examine your conversations, your burdens, what kept you up this week, what made you angry, what frustrated you, what you posted on your social media feed, what would we guess you were most passionate about this week? If you had to be truthful about how you make decisions and why you make decisions, can we actually say it is because I am driven with a purpose to see other individuals grow spiritually for the glory of God? I've done a lot of driving the last few weeks. I've made a few trips. Lord willing, by the end of the day, when I say I'm done, Lord willing, I will drive into West Virginia. Hopefully after that, I'll still have a few more hours to drive to Monday to get me to the beach. I was going to say to see warmth, but you guys are going to have plenty of warmth while I'm gone here. In my long hours of driving, which I actually kind of enjoy, I enjoy a long drive. Um, it's easy to get distracted sometimes. The scenery, the car that just zipped past you that you're kind of getting, trying to catch their eye to make sure they know that they're being a stupid driver. 
the kids that are just being ruckus in the back, that you're trying to catch their eyes in the rearview mirror, like you're giving them a look like you better act up because you do not want me to stop right now. And it's easy to get distracted. There's a, there's a little element on every highway that stops us from that. It's the little rumble strip on the side of the highway. You know what I'm talking about? I was in northern Indiana a couple weeks ago driving back. Long week of class, distracted. And we got to, in northern Indiana before Chicago, you get to like this windmill farm. There's like a hundred of them. And I remember staring off at these windmill farms, who knows how long. And all of a sudden, the, the, the car just goes into the whole kind of mode. My kids love that kind of segment. Levi just loves that. That's so much fun, Dad. We're not supposed to be on this part, Levi. We need to come back to the real road. The rumble strip is just a simple tactic. You say, wake up. You're not focusing what you're supposed to be focusing on right now. I prayed this week that the testimony of Apostle Paul in the middle of far more suffering than you and I are going to experience with the loss of far more freedoms than we could, we could. would serve as a rumble strip to shake us awake and say, wait a minute here. Have you become distracted? You're not even looking at what you're supposed to be looking at right now. Christian, some of us just need to turn off the news. Let's get really practical. You, you ain't going to change it. Some of us need to just turn off social media. Just stop reading it. You'd have more discerning if you spent the time in God's word and saying, God, change my heart, direct me. Shape my burdens and passions today. The sad reality is sometimes we have lost our joy. We think God's not working, he's lost control. When God is working all around us to change people through the Holy Spirit's power and Christ's love. And we're depressed because that physical thing's not happening. When God says, I'm doing something far greater. <laughs> far greater than you could ask or think. Fall in love with this. Strive for this. Focus on this. Don't be distracted. And so, Father God, I thank you that I get to pray to you. And I simply use the words of Apostle Paul and I pray for a church body. And I pray that the power of the Holy Spirit will work inside of us to transform us in the inner being of who we are. And I pray for a church to come to a greater realization of God's un incomprehensible love for them. And that's not too big of you to do. So I pray that you would do just that. Ultimately for your glory in this church. Whatever generations are to come. That you would be glorified. God, would you push us to this purpose? Would you focus us upon this purpose? Would this purpose give us the real joy? Would this purpose, would this purpose give us peace? With his purpose, give us direction this week. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.